series. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is where we're going this morning for the uh, message. And um, 1 Corinthians 9, and while you turn there, I was thinking as they were singing about Psalm 27. You go to 1 Corinthians 9, I'll read Psalm 27. Beginning in verse 4, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me upon a rock. Amen. And uh, that certainly is true the more time that we spend with him. And the interesting song, by the way, Secret Place, is not secret at all. The Lord said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and um, we want to kind of... Uh, somebody asked me how I was doing this morning. I said 100 mile an hour. I think, it was, I think it was Hugh. And he said, well, try to find second gear. And I said, well, <laughs> I'm not sure, but what I might have to throw it into reverse. And that's what I'm going to have to do this morning. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter number 9. And uh, we have been looking at some principles on how to have a blessed year. And thinking about that, we're... Now, uh, the middle of January, uh, already, uh, in the month, uh, the first month almost gone, and uh, we need some principles to help us come to the end of this year uh, spiritually better than we were last year. Uh, but we're going to have to have a certain mindset for that to happen, uh, and the Lord wants it to happen. We want to be clear about that. Uh, but we'll have to keep our head straight through it if we're going to see it take place. And so we've been, we've been uh, taking principles from 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. And uh, beginning here in verse 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth uh, the air. And he's talking here about uh, correct stewardship of time and all that, and we'll touch on some of that as we go. But he says that here, verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Lord, I pray that you would help, uh, help us now this morning as we open your word. Thank you for the music we've heard this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to sing unto you. Thank you for the scriptures we've considered to this point. I pray that you'd please at this moment uh, cleanse me, help me, Lord, to be filled with the Spirit. And Father, help me, I pray, above all to be faithful to your word. Uh, that, uh, that these that are gathered here may be helped, those that are watching by live stream as well, and strengthened uh, for the year ahead in our walk with you. We are desperately dependent upon your truth to know which way to go. And so, Lord, help us uh, d uh, rightly divide it today. And I'll thank you for any result, of course, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I need to, last week we were talking, and we have, I should say at this point, talked about uh, the reasons for being faithful in the race that God's called us to. Every one of us has a course to run. Paul said he had finished his course and he was ready to go on to heaven. The fact that uh, you are still here, at least for this moment, and hearing these words and breathing God's air means it's not your turn to go yet. I was sharing with our seniors the other day that somebody once said, it's a blessing when you hear someone eulogize another and realize you're hearing it. Amen? <laughs> but uh, until we come to that point, we've got, a, we've got a race to run. We've got a work to do for the Lord Jesus Christ. And 
We need to realize uh, the responsibilities of that. We need to realize the motivations in it, and that's kind of what we have been uh, sharing with you over this last little while, uh, having to do with the motivations of why we stay in the race. We need to understand the reasons for what we do. Uh, and, of course, we said that we need to be faithful because... Uh, of the reward that's to be won. That's what Paul mentions here in these verses. There's an eternal reward for those of us that uh, are faithful to him. But then also, not just the crown he mentions, but the crowd. And we mentioned several that are watching, the Savior, the saints, and the skeptical. And all of these are part of our stewardship, uh, the stewardship of our life. You and I need to be found faithful in that stewardship so that these that are watching might be encouraged and not hindered. Uh, they might be blessed and not burdened, our Savior, the saints, and the skeptical. Without doubt, we've said we, we live our life. How we live our life matters now and in eternity. And so we seek to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, as the Scripture puts it, and we try to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world by remembering these reasons. But then last week we entered into this second uh, section, which would be also to understand that there are requirements for the race. Every athlete knows there are rules for the game. There are rules for uh, life. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2 and 5, if a man strive for the masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. Now look, that means there are principles we've, we must follow if we're to honor God. Hey, the work of the ministry is not a free-for-all where we just do what we want. Uh, our responsibility is to understand what God instructs and demands and follow his uh, instruction, follow his word to us. That's true in life in general, but most certainly uh, as we build the house, remembering that Jesus said, I will build my church. And uh, you know, uh, maybe some parent here has said it to a child, my house, my rules. Amen. Amen. Well, no, 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 no more is that any more true than in the house of the Lord. The Lord said, my house, my rules. And so we need to understand that he has instructed us uh, in the way of uh, uh, the work of uh, the ministry as we live out our life. Our whole life should be a ministry. And so if, if we're going to be successful in that, we said we're going to have to have discipline. You see that there in verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. The undisciplined man is an unfaithful man, which is an unfruitful man. You'll have to put discipline and organization and commitment and determination into your life if you're going to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and be successful in this life for his glory, not your own. And so we, we, as we began to talk about discipline, we were reminded of Gen uh, Genesis 49 where Jacob said of Reuben, declaring the forecast of his life, he said, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Uh, the unstable person is the one uh, that ends up making a ruin of their life because they have no direct determined direction in which to go. We need discipline to run the race. Every athlete that is successful in the world is disciplined. Well, maybe with the exception of sumo wrestlers, then they, you know, the size makes up for that, I guess. I'm not sure. Uh, I remember when we lived in Japan, I heard uh, somebody had written an article or something while we were over about how many pounds of rice they eat every day. And I love Asian rice. Amen. I'm not talking about Uncle Ben's. That's not from Asia. Somebody said Uncle Ben's is really just a ground-up cardboard. That's what Uncle Ben's is. <laughs> I like Asian sticky rice. Amen. Amen. Well, okay. You can have lunch in a minute. But I remember hearing about the sumo wrestlers and thinking to myself, whoa, whoa. What glory that would be just to bury yourself in some Asian rice for a while. Amen. And they do it a lot of while. Uh, but even then, uh, they are disciplined. In the matter of fact, the Japanese were very much on uh, form. They were very much on technique. And for a long time, 
uh, it was not even possible as a foreigner to be the grand champion sumo wrestler. You had to be from Japan. And uh, still, uh, even though that was changed later on, uh, the Japanese would often speak somewhat uh, with disdain of sumos from other countries. They would say, oh, they might be big and, you know, they might uh, this, that, and the other, but their technique is not right. The same was true of golf. Anyway, whatever. They, they believed in technique. They were disciplinarians in their technique. And the same should be true of you and I spiritually, much more spiritually than in the world. The most, one of the most difficult areas of our life is that which we began discussing last week, and that is the discipline to stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Uh, most time, if somebody's in a race and they get out of their lane, the only thing left is destruction after that. And you know, we remind you again that the old NASCAR adage, racing is rubbing, that didn't come out of the Bible. That came from a spirit of competition. And so we need to stay in our lane. And we talked about several lanes, uh, several roles, the danger of role reversal. We talked about all that uh, last week. But we talked about these roles that God has given us in our ra uh, race. Uh, and so since I've talked about rice, let me just say I'm not talking about lunch rolls. Amen. <laughs> I'm talking about responsibilities. Uh, lanes that you and I are to live in, lanes that you and I are to run in, lanes that you and I are to serve in. We have a course. We have a role to fulfill. And we said there were three of them. First was the roles related to enablement. We talked about the giftedness that God gives us. If we're going to be successful or more, I should say fruitful for the Lord's glory in 2023, we'll have to determine what he's gifted us to do and get in it. Amen. The second thing we mentioned with regard to roles, the roles related to enablement, but then also the, the roles related to engenderment. And we spent some time talking about the fact that there are two genders and that God has given roles to people even based on gender. Now, that's not popular in our day, but we're not worried about pleasing the world. We're interested in pleasing the Lord. So in the, in, the, in the Christian home and in God's home, there are roles related to gender. We talked about those. And uh, then we said that there are also roles related to employment. If you're going to do well in 2023, you're going to have to understand your role in your employment. We talked, about, uh, uh, we talked toward that end with regard to our employment in the world. Uh, and uh, in uh, 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 Titus, uh, if you'll go there with me just by way of review, in Titus chapter 2 and verse 9, because this has to do with where we are going here in a moment, Titus chapter number 2 and verse 9, Paul said, Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and uh, to please them well in all things. So he's talking here about a relationship with those who uh, who may be uh, uh, managers or those that are over us. Certainly in this day, it would have even included uh, slavery. And Paul uh, taught uh, uh, the God, I should say through Paul, taught people how to behave in such a way as to have the greatest impact for Christ in their life, no matter what their role was currently. But he said here that there ought to be a proper attitude toward this uh, authority. Exhort service to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well, not answering again. And we talked about that means stop talking back. I mean, I've heard some of you that are in places of management that there no, uh, may never have been a generation so sass mouth than the one we have in this one. That does not honor God. Don't call yourself a Christian and go to work and act like that. Be much better if you just didn't say anything about being a Christian at all. Hello. And so he said... Uh, not answering again, not purloining, that means stealing. Now, you can steal time, that, you know, doing things you shouldn't be doing on the job because your time is your boss's. Uh, uh, it can include materials, uh, all that, and they used to focus a great deal in the, in, uh, the um, military about uh, fraud, waste, and abuse, you know. And they were trying to stop it while they were living in it. Amen. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm sorry about that. But uh, anyway... Uh, you can purloin, you can steal. Watch, showing all good fidelity. Be faithful. Be faithful. A true 
uh, to those for whom you uh, are responsible and to whom you're responsible. You do that be, uh, in all fidelity and, of course, faithful to God. Uh, he mentions that here, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. And so he talks here about the importance of, uh, of, uh, of having discipline to, uh, with uh, regard to our uh, role of employment. But I want to step back uh, this morning. I, I say I want to. I feel somewhat like Jude, who intended to write of the common salvation, but it was needful, he said, to write that you defend the faith once delivered to the saints. I, this morning in my review, sat down to intending to continue in uh, the uh, next step of this particular series of messages and uh, the Lord <laughs> reminded me I had some unfinished business with relation to the idea of the church and its organization. Uh, I had intended due to time, I had not referenced some things uh, uh, that I thought may be um, taken for granted, and the Lord uh, reminded me this morning to finish the message. And so that's what I'm going to do. We, uh, we're talking about our role in employment, and we said last week we talked about when it comes to the matter of the church, not just the world, but the church, we are employed in the work of the Lord. Now, some are full-time and others are voluntary, but we're all full-time Christian. Amen. And we are employed in the Lord, and, uh, and so uh, uh, the Lord has, responsibility, has uh, uh, some instruction for us with regard to accountability uh, related to authority, not only in the world, but in the church. The church uh, uh, is indeed his organization. And we said last week that there are some, because of that, that will say Jesus is the head, and therefore he's the only one to whom I must answer. And so in the end, every person does that which is right in their own eyes. But each of those verses that... It, uh, are quoted after that fashion in Judges also say there was no king in Israel. In other words, there was no authority and so they did what they wanted. The Lord uh, certainly doesn't desire that type of approach. The Bible says in Proverbs 12 and 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. And we said a church that lacks organizational structure, uh, and we should say a church that lacks respect for that organizational structure, uh, uh, it will eventually devolve into nothing better than herding cats, which is a vain attempt. Well, well, never mind. First Corinthians 14 and 40 says, let all things be done decently and in order. Now, the Lord has a, an order for his church. And if you'll look with me at Ephesians chapter number 4, that's what we alluded to last week. Ephesians chapter number 4, and beginning in verse number 11, he said he gave some apostles, now that was for a particular time in the church, and some prophets, that was for a particular time in the church, and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And if you wanted to divide this uh, by time, we would have those that would be considered evangelists today. That is, we call some evangelists that are itinerant preachers. There are those that believe the evangelists of the New Testament were missionaries. Those that went and won people to Christ and discipled them and planted uh, churches in, uh, in other cultures and places. But nonetheless, we see evangelists and pastors and teachers. And uh, generally, those would be referred to as, uh, in many cases, as the same office, though not always so. There are those that are gifted to teach. We went through this uh, some, well, last year now, I guess, right? Uh, but not necessarily to pastor. And so, but certainly the pastor is supposed to be apt to teach. So both uh, would be included with regard to that office. But he tells us why here in verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, that's the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. How long till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man? So you can count on this. That's not going to happen until we go to heaven. So the end result is that from, uh, from now until the time we go to heaven, God has given us these 
uh, pastors and teachers for the purpose of, per, uh, of perfecting the saints. Now, uh, he says why again in verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Oh, I'm getting another sermon right now. Look, we are living in a day where the Bible says they will not endure sound doctrine. Let me tell you something. People don't want the meat of the word anymore. They want their ears tickled. They want to be fluffed up where they are and patted on the back and say, boy, keep at it. And um, the Bible tells us that the responsibility of the preacher, of course, is to go far deeper than that. And if, if, the, if the preacher's responsibility is there, then uh, the responsibility of uh, the people are to receive it, apply it, and put it to work in their life. That just makes good sense to me. But we with regard to this, we touched on uh, a few verses. I want to go back to Hebrews with you. Hebrews, uh, chapter number 3, or excuse me, 13, Hebrews 13. <clears throat> There's a reason for this introduction. Uh, Hebrews 13 and verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, and we talked about that word, who have spoken unto you the word of God. That defines whom it is that has the rule over you, those that have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. The Lord says you need to follow uh, the, uh, the uh, man of God there, if you will. Uh, they've spoken to you the word of God, and you need to consider their lifestyle. You need, their life needs to back up their message, all right? And so this is not just blind allegiance. Verse 17 Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Why? For they watch for your souls that they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For this is unprofitable for you. You know there are a lot of people that, oh, I don't have time for this. There are a lot of people that uh, will leave a church and they'll get disgruntled with it and they'll say something like this. I told that preacher. And I think that if it weren't for the... It, it, <laughs> If it weren't for the glorification that God's going to give us one day, I think there'd be people in heaven telling the Lord the same thing. I told that preacher. But that's not going to fly. Notice who it's unprofitable for. We're talking about somebody that, that's honoring the Bible, that's trying to honor God. Who's it unprofitable for at the judgment day? Not the preacher. Hello. But you. All right. Verse 24. Salute them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Now, I have to say in transparency that those particular verses are difficult for me to speak on. I make no apology for, the, apology for that difficulty because there will always be someone that will make accusation that we're trying to make more of ourselves, that we're trying to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. I, I can assure you uh, under God that that is not my intention. Um, but... There needs to be, because of that, clarification about uh, God's requirements with regard to this matter of church leadership. Uh, there, there should be, and, and I was taught this, the Bible tells me that uh, I, the things that I've learned I should pass on to faithful men who should be able to pass on to faithful people. Amen. And so... There should be in our life a proper respect and approach to spiritual authority. Uh, our world, not to say our churches, has lost sight of what respectable spiritual leadership entails. And uh, because they are more Corinthian than Christ-like. Now... There are several illustrations of this problem in the Bible. We could, if we wanted to, look at Pharaoh with Moses. We could, uh, of course, Pharaoh being the worldly authority and Moses being the spiritual authority. We could also look at, within the realm of God's people, Korah with Moses and the problem that took place there in number 16. Uh, we could also look... Uh, at the Corinthians with Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, where there were some that had come into the church at Corinth that were questioning Paul's apostleship. They were questioning, therefore, his authority. Um, but this morning, I want to take up the account 
that we read of with regard to Ahaziah and Elijah. And that is in 2 Kings. So if you would turn with me, please, to 2 Kings. And uh, generally, when people come into the house of God, uh, they expect to... Uh, they expect to hear, uh, if I got this right, 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 1 through 15. I want to make sure I'm in the right book, of course. Uh, no, let's go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings. And uh, we'll get there in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> that when people come into the house of the Lord, they intend to receive a message from the preacher with regard to their life and how they should live. Uh, this morning, I want to relate to you because of my statements last week. Uh, the responsibility that from which we talk about this matter of authority with regard to the preacher. And um, I still haven't found that thing. And I looked at it three times this morning, which just means I'm confused. Maybe somebody this morning can give me the passage uh, with Ahaziah and Elijah. Anybody got that with you? Thank you. First Kings... <laughs> and we have to be there because uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work without it. No, that's not it either. Maybe it's 2 Kings 18. Hold on, I'm going to get there. I'm looking for the place where Elijah's on the mountain. And Ahaziah... Sent, the, sent his uh, people to talk to him. Has anybody got that? I'm going to look up Ahaziah. Now, I know it might seem strange. No, we're talking about that place where... where Ahaziah was sick. He fell through a lattice. Uh, and um, he um, sent to Beelzebub. You remember? Amen. Say that again, Brother Andy. No, the last part. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. I didn't see it. <laughs> there it is. I got it now. Amen. We've got to be there. 2 Kings chapter number 1 and uh, beginning in verse 1. 2 Kings 1 and verse 1. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub the God of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Now therefore thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up. He said, You don't need the devil to tell you, I'm going to tell you. Amen but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are you now turned back? They said unto him, There came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Uh, uh, Ekron? Uh, therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? They answered him, He is an hairy man and girt with a, gir uh, a girdle of leather 
uh, about his loins, and he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty, and he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill. Uh, and uh, th that was Elijah. And he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king has said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. And again also he sent unto him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. Now note this. Come down, come down quickly. Stop dilly-dallying. Listen, do as I say. Now, all right? Uh, and so, by the way, that's what the world is always trying to get the Christian to do. Come down. And not only come down, but come down quickly. And so, uh, he sent again that captain. Uh, 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 he said the same words in verse 12. If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee in thy fifty. Fire of God came down from heaven, consumed him and his fifty. And he sent again the captain of the third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire down from heaven and burn up the two captains of the former. Here's what he's saying. Oh, preacher, he said, listen, I'm just trying to tell you I learned lessons. <laughs> Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And he, watch this now. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, I'm going to show you in just a moment, time willing, that none of this was Elijah's doings. It all came from the Lord. And so he said, uh, go down, uh, the angels of the Lord said unto Elijah, go down with him. Be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down uh, with him to the king. But Elijah still didn't change his message to Elisha, I mean uh, Ahaziah. He said, uh, thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, uh, is it not because there is no God in Israel to inquire of his word? He didn't change his message. Look, these, uh, these uh, uh, leaders under Ahaziah, they changed their tune, but Elijah didn't change his message. And so uh, we see this illustration of uh, a proper respect that you and I ought to have for spiritual authority in our life. We're living in a generation that has no respect for authority at all, nearly. Any authority much less spiritual authority. And let me hasten to say uh, that this is the fault of the pastors in many ways. Hosea 4 and 9 says, and there shall be like people, like priests. Now, I know there's no more priests and there's no more prophets, uh, but the idea is, again, the whole idea of come down. And let me tell you, that's exactly what neo-evangelicalism is doing to the office of the preachers across our land. Instead of saying, go up and be for us unto God, they're saying, come down and be like us. See? And so, uh, uh, Hosea, uh, yeah, Hosea said, uh, uh, there shall be like people, like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them their doings. Men of God in our day are increasingly becoming men of the world, not men of God. And to that point, we'll need to say, of course, that that which is respected must first be respectable. Amen. And so we preach these truths that God has laid on my heart this morning, uh, not, as, not from a sense of reward, but, uh, but overwhelmingly responsibility responsibility now there are those in the churches that order respect they are diatrophies who's who desire to have the preeminence and then there are those that move beyond ordering it to earning it and there's a world of difference between those two things our desire for spirit. And so, what does that look like, though? 
What does that look like uh, with regard to spiritual authority? And how do we know what type of spiritual authority, and speaking specifically with regard to the man of God and in the context of the local church along the lines of the message that would refer to the pastor of the assembly? What are you looking for? Well, uh, we ought to be looking for that which we see demonstrated in Elijah. Several characteristics of spiritual leadership. All right? The first one is this. That the, the man of God, is to, if he's to be respected, is one that must be faithful to God in the face of the world. Look at verse 3. Uh, the Bible says uh, uh, in, in verse 3, uh, But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, uh, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub? What are you doing? You, you, you're going the wrong way. Uh, a, a, a spiritual authority that, that is to be respected is one that demands God's people live above the world. That they live above what the world is doing. Look, Eli, Elijah didn't mix the world's philosophy. He nixed the world's philosophy. And any man of God that's worth his weight and salt will be one that must be faithful to God in the face of the world. The second thing is he must be faithful to God in declaring the word. Look at verse 4. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord. That's Elijah's word. Now, now, you, now look, the only authority that a preacher has is the authority of God's word. And so he has not his responsibility to... Uh, to, to, to quote his own ideas and carry out his own direction, he is to say, thus saith the Lord. He's to be faithful in the declaration of the word of God despite the impending danger of doing so. Which anymore, as we've often uh, said somewhat in jest, it could mean uh, uh, getting your pink slip after service. It could mean being imprisoned in a hateful world. But the man of God must be faithful to the word. And Micaiah gave that sentiment when they were trying to tempt him, which we'll, say in, we'll refer to in just a moment. He said, as the Lord liveth, that which the Lord saith, that will I speak. And so uh, there must be a, 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 a faithfulness to God in the face of the world and uh, faithful to God in declaring the word. And then a, 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 a spiritual authority that is to be respected is one that is committed to intervening in the path of sin. Look at verse 5. When the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are you now turned back? I like that phrase. That, hey, Elijah got there. They didn't go any further. Listen to what I'm telling you. They were confronted by the word of God from the man of God. Listen, and they turned back. This is a picture to some degree of repentance. And so they asked them, Why are you come back? Verse 6. They said unto him, There came a man to meet us said unto us, Go turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the God, the, the Beelzebub, the God uh, uh, of Ekron? Brother, we need a generation of preachers that stands against sin in the wrong way, the wrong path. And the, I, God told Isaiah, Cry aloud and spare not, he said. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Amen. That's responsibility. Interesting, though, we're talking about respecting spiritual authority, right? But in many ways, being faithful to that particular thing uh, results in disrespect and rejection. And so that's one reason why God told Ezekiel, he said, I'm giving you a forehead hard stone. <laughs> and uh, why? The burden of the Lord. I don't have time for that burden of the Lord. But anyway, uh, so Ahab, listen to Ahab. What Ahab said of Micaiah, we referred to Micaiah a moment ago. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, they were trying to get together and have a big powwow, figured out if they could uh, uh, go to battle or not. Uh, and they were bringing the prophets before them. And Jehoshaphat, is there another prophet besides these? And, uh, and uh, Ahab said, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, uh, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I 
hate him. Why? For he does not prophesy good concerning me. That describes this generation. Right. Uh, well, if your name's Ahab, uh, he, he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat, uh, Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. You don't mean it. Yeah. You think Jehoshaphat knew something about Ahab? Huh? And Jehoshaphat knew, no wonder. Hey, hey, think about it, Ahab. Yeah. Anyway, and here's the thing, though. He knew. Because when they finally dragged uh, Micaiah up there, and they were already encouraging me. Now, look, all the prophets are saying good things. Please, please, don't stir up a ruckus. Just say what everybody else is saying. Huh? That's what they told him. And so uh, he did. Go up. Now listen. In 2 Kings twenty two sixteen, 16, And the king, the one that hated him, said, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? He knew he wasn't right with God. And he expected the man of God to tell him so. Hello. He knew it. And so the purpose for this type of preaching, by the way, is, uh, is not for domination, but because of devotion. Uh, and uh, Galatians 4 and 16, Paul was trying to correct the Galatians. He said at some point, I stand in doubt of you. Do you really think that that which you began in the spirit, you're going to finish in the flesh? And he was trying to correct them and uh, must have been a little bit rough for them to receive because he said in Galatians 4, 16, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? This generation thinks so. Hmm. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 4, 15, but speak the truth in love. Amen. And then look at Haggai, will you? I'll give you a minute to get there. Haggai. And here's the... <laughs> If you want to see the whole message right here in just a few verses, you'll find the whole purpose of this kind of preaching, you'll find it in Haggai. And uh, chapter number 1, and the, uh, beginning in verse 1, Haggai 1 and 1. Now watch. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, this people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. In other words, they were neglecting the house of the Lord. Verse 3, then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you or ye to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Oh, I see. Your purposes are more important than God's. I mean, he called them out on it. Now, verse 5, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. By the way, any faithful man of God will encourage people to consider their ways. Think about your life. Think about what you're going through. Think about what's happening to you and pay attention to God. All right? Verse 6, he tells them, You've sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none more. And uh, he that earneth wages, putteth wages to, uh, uh, earneth wages to be put in a bag with holes. You can't get anywhere. you got problems on every hand. Verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Now watch, verse 8. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I'll burn it down. Oh, wait, that's not what it says. Build the house, watch, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Look, the Lord is saying, if you'll just turn around and head the right direction, not only will I be pleased and glorified, but I'll bless your life as a result. That's the purpose for preaching that calls us to attentiveness to our waywardness. And so, uh, a, back to our uh, text in 1 Kings 1, I let go of it. Uh, I'll need to get back there because I am sure it's 1 Kings 1. Amen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, man. Is that right? 2 Kings 1, thank you. I am not sure it's 1 Kings 1. All right. You need, 
respectful spiritual authority is authority that intervenes in the path of sin. Then I'd like to say this, that respectful uh, spiritual authority is faithful to live and minister in a distinctive manner. To live and to minister in a distinctive manner. Now you find that uh, down in uh, verse number 7. And he said unto them, for, uh, 2 Kings, excuse me, 1 and 7, and he said unto them, what manner of man, that's a key phrase right there, what manner of man was he that came up to meet you and told you these words? What did he look like? What was he like? And certainly the ministry of Elijah was one that was distinctive. It was distinct from the other prophets around him. It was distinct from those certainly that were wayward, that's for sure. But it was distinctive in several ways. It was distinctive, first of all, in its direction. Look at back at verse 3. The angel of the Lord said. Elijah's direction came from heaven, not the world. Amen. Now, that's not popular today uh, with regard especially to the leadership of the churches. But he said, the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, it came from heaven. Jesus said this, by the way, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. All of the direction comes from heaven in the heart of a genuine man of God. All right? It doesn't come from peers. There are a couple of kinds of pressures that come upon preachers, and one of those are his peers. That's why preachers' fellowships are either a blessing or a blight. Hello. Now you say, well, how can you say that? Because I are one. I mean, you either find encouragement or discouragement. You either find people that are helping you to be more godly or they're, helping to, they're creating a spirit of competition that the churches begin to fall prey to. That's right. It's not our peers. Uh, the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah, we spoke about that a moment ago, and uh, he said, let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them. No, no, not his peers. But it's also not the people. Yeah. It's not. L look at 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8. Now, I'm going to put a mark in 2 Kings so I don't mess up again. <laughs> 1 Samuel chapter 8. And I want to show you. I'm speaking today of the responsibility of those that would profess to be men of God. And what you should expect to see in me or any other spiritual authority in your life. And so uh, it, he says in 1 Samuel chapter number 8, uh, and uh, down here uh, in verse 6, look at it. But, uh, well, verse 5, the people said unto him, Behold, thou art old, <laughs> and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now beware, children of preachers. Hello. Now make us a king to judge us like, look, look, like all the nations. Preacher, please help us like be, be like the world around us. Huh? Wow. And watch. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. And then when you get down here to uh, verse number 18, he begins to describe basically our government. They're going to take a little bit of everything you have. Hello. All right, I'll save that for later. Verse 18, and ye shall cry out in that day because of your king. Remember what you wanted? which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Hmm. And so the preacher's, uh, the preacher's first responsibility is the pleasure of the Lord, not the pleasure of the people. His first responsibility is to the Lord, not you. 
Now, if you can't understand why that might be a difficulty, then you've never faced somebody that's trying to put leverage on the preacher, huh? that's considering only themselves and not the entire church. Hello. Okay. I prayed about this this morning. Now watch this now. He needs to be somebody that's distinctive in his ministry manner. Then he needs to be somebody that's distinctive, not only in his direction, but in his dress. Uh, look at verse 8 with me. And they answered, he was a hairy man. Now that don't mean you have to have a beard. It doesn't mean you can't have one. All right? But here's the thing. You could tell he was a man. Hello. I've just started and it's noon. He, he look, he, he was a hairy man. He ought to look like a man. He ought to know his gender, not be confused about it. And uh, uh, the Bible says again, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. And that's what we've got today. Now, I just have to preach the truth. Uh, effeminate. Uh, and it's confusing a generation of young people. Because men won't be men. Now look. Okay, I'm going to move on. I talked about that last week, but I had to get that in. So it was here, man. Look. And gird about with a girdle of leather about his loins. All right, let's just say this. You're not, looking in, you're not first looking for a fashionable fella. Hmm? That's right. And you say, preacher, we're not worried about that at all. <laughs> uh, not worried about that. Not fashionable, but functional. His focus is not on dressing and acting like the world. Amen. By the way, with regard to the ladies, the Bible says, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting of hair, wearing of gold, or putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. Amen. Look, there's no place in the ministry, I mean real ministry, Bible ministry, uh, for worldly peacocks, as Spurgeon used to call them. Amen. His dress. And it ought to be respectable, of course. But the, anyway, the next thing is he ought to be distinct in his determination. In verse number four, again, if you look at the first part of the verse, now therefore, thus saith the Lord. Now, we've referred to that a moment ago. But his confidence is in the word of the Lord. His confidence is not in his own words. His confidence is not in his own thoughts. It's in the word of the Lord. This, uh, and he's determined to stick by the word. Why? Hebrews 4 and 12, for the word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of thunder uh, of the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the preacher's determination. Now, I think, of course, having been here as long as we have, that you would be pretty near sure, there it is again, pretty near sure that we're not going to defer from the left hand or to the right. We're going to stay with the Bible, even if it limits our fellowship. Amen. All right. Determination is the Word of God. Then his deportment. Now, I want you, this is so important because it really reflects why I'm going back over this. Because it's such a burden. Verse 10, and Elijah answered. Now here comes the first captain. You got to come down. Verse 10, watch. Elijah answered and said to the captain of the 50, If I be a man of God. He didn't say, Yeah, you're right. And you better get right. Look what he said. If I be man of God. You know what that recognizes? It recognizes God as the authority and not himself. If I be a man of God. This was Paul's demeanor as well. I, when Paul said when he came to the Corinthians, I came to you, I came not with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring the testimony of God. I determined not to know anything among you save Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. That's the proper deportment. But then not only distinctive in his deportment, he should be distinctive in his dependency. In verse 10, 
uh, if I be a man of God, watch now, then let fire come out of my eyes. Oh, that's not what it said. Let fire come down from where? That's it. That's it. Paul said, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And my speech and my preaching was not enticing words of man wisdom, man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. All right, I'm almost there. Maybe you're glad. He should be distinctive in his dependency. So he should be faithful, faithful to have a distinctive manner of ministry in his person and in his work. But then, this is where I'd like to close and that is that he should be faithful to live on a higher plane. Now, look at verse 9. Then the king sent unto him a captain of his fifty, with his fifty, and he went up to him. And behold, he sat on the top of a hill, a different plane. Uh, and what I mean by this, now listen carefully because I'm trying to ex describe my heart when I talk about responsibility, uh, and, and specifically mine. It's not aloof. It's not arrogant. It is aloft with God. Aloft with God. Now, look in your Bible at 1 Peter chapter 5 because he lays it out here clearly, defines this for us. 1 Peter chapter number 5. And um, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1. 1 Peter 5 and 1. Now watch. Now the elders, uh, that's a reference to the pastor, elder, bishop, all that, same ones. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Watch now. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither is, here it is, being lords over God's heritage. That refers to not being a dictator and all of that, but being in samples to the flock. And a realization of the responsibility, verse 4. And when the chief, shep, uh, chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory. And then, no, look, every preacher that's worth his weight there, he understands that Jesus is the head of the church. He understands his future accountability to him. So we're not talking about somebody that's arrogant. We're not talking about a diatrophies. Uh, we're, we're not talking about, again, somebody that's aloof or, 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 or arrogant, but somebody that desires to be aloft with God. Isn't that where Moses went up into the mountain to meet with God? And so that's true in a couple of ways, and here's where I'll close. It's true, first of all, spiritually. Spiritually. Uh, look in your Bible at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. And uh, beginning in uh, verse 1. And he says here, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them. By the way, if you have a Christian manager or a Christian boss, you better not take uh, advantage of that uh, 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 Christ-like graciousness and kindness. Amen. Don't despise them for that. Uh, they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, uh, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness... From such withdraw thyself. Yeah. But godliness with contentment is great gain. All right. And so he talks here about they that will be rich. Verse number uh, 9. Fall into temptation, a snare, and many foolish and hurtful lusts. Now look at verse 11 with me, would you? But thou, 
O man of God, flee these things. Let me tell you, no spiritual authority that is nothing more than a dressed up worldling deserves the respect of the people of God. Amen. And so uh, he reminds us that we, we should be living on, uh, flee these things. Look at verse 11. And follow after righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience and meekness. Fight the good fight. Lay hold on eternal life. Somebody that's living for a higher purpose than the world. And so he's to live on a higher plane. They went up to Elijah. And then that's true spiritually, but it's also true functionally. Functionally. Now, if uh, you look back here at, uh, at, at uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Now, you remember, just back one page. You remember in the book of Acts when they had so many people saved and the church had exploded and they were not able uh, to care for everybody and there were some people getting neglected in the daily ministration uh, in Acts chapter 6. Matter of fact, turn back there because I'm going to read this first and then we're going uh, back to 1 Timothy 4. In Acts chapter number 6 and verse 1, in those days when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And uh, then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and says, Not reason we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Now, it's clear they had the authority of appointment of those uh, two that, were, that were selected by the church. Verse 4, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Uh, they said, for it isn't reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. And uh, so I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But functionally, these, these men needed to be in the word and in prayer for the sake of feeding the flock of God. That was their first responsibility. All right. Well, if you go back to 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse 11. 1 Timothy 4 and 11. And this is what Paul told Timothy. He told Timothy uh, in verse 11, these things command, and te- command because Timothy's teaching them? No. Command because God said. All right? These things command and teach, verse 12, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading to exhortation, that's preaching, to doctrine, that's teaching, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. In other words, he's saying you got to get to work at what God's given you to do. This is your purpose. This is your responsibility. Don't, hey, don't neglect it. And so he says, verse 15, meditate upon these things. Give thyself what? Don't say part-time. Huh? I'm not talking about part-time preachers. I'm talking about preachers that end up run crazy over stuff that is, uh, that is stealing from God's primary purpose for their life. Okay. Meditate on these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Look. That thy profiting may appear to, not your money making, huh? but your time with God may appear to all. Listen, that's what the church needs, isn't it? Hey, when Moses came down from the mount with God, the, his face shone with the presence of God. Not for Moses' glory, but for the help and encouragement of the people. He had been with God. Amen. Take heed to thyself, verse 16, and under the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt uh, 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 both save thyself and them that hear thee. And so, functionally, he needs to live on that higher plane. And what I mean by that is ministry of of prayer, uh, uh, prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, you remember our text back there? Come down, come down. Do you know that's constant in the ministry? 
come down, hello, hey, come down and do this. Come down and do that. Come down and make sure that what I expect to see you have done by next week's done. Wow. It's a constant battle against the come downs. Now, uh, this can happen in a preacher's family. You remember Job and Lot? Job's wife said, oh, just curse God and die. Lot's wife, he, he, he couldn't get, she couldn't get the world out of her, and so he was trying to lead him out, and she was looking back, and she became a pillar of salt. It can also happen, not only in the preacher's family, but it can happen in the preacher's fellowship. And this is what they said to Moses, come down. This is what they said to Nehemiah, come down, oh no. This is what they said to the apostles at Jerusalem. We just read that. The, uh, why does this happen? I'll tell you why, and I'm going to pray. Because the Joshuas and the Aarons and the Hurs and the Timothys are almost gone. And we've done some of this to ourselves. Can I go ahead and just shoot straight? I've already done it. <laughs> because we have a certain already respect for spiritual leadership. We say the pastor should be the overseer and all that kind of thing. But what we've done is we say that the pastor should be the overseer, therefore he needs to be doing everything. And that's not in the Bible. Now, the people that work in the church are responsible to him. I gave that to you last week. Uh, but I want to I reemphasize to you uh, this one last verse in uh, uh, Exodus 17. Because I just mentioned Moses... Exodus 17, and, and you will know we're going, this. many of you will know we're going this passage on Aaron and Hur. And we'll begin in verse 8, Exodus 17 and 8. Now, they're in a battle. Would you agree we're in a battle today? They're in a battle. They're in a battle with the world and its hordes. And so in verse 8, then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow, I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Now, once you watch this, uh, let's just make clear that Moses had already demonstrated his faithfulness to God and God's call on his life. So it wasn't like Moses was trying to get out of anything. But he said, Joshua, you grab some folks and go down there and take care of this. I'm going to stand on the hill up high there with God. Remember what the Bible said, that, the, that, that God has given pastors uh, for the, to, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The whole picture is clear here. All right? So Joshua did as Moses said unto him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the mount. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand, there's a, a picture, if you will, of prayer and seeking of God, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. I wonder how much of this influx of the world into the church is because preachers' time before God has been stolen or they have chosen not to do what they should be doing. I wonder. And so uh, he, Amalek prevailed, verse 12, but Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him and sat there on. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on his right hand, the other on the, uh, 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 one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, only because of the help of Aaron and Hur. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Uh, and so, uh, watch this now. I want you to notice here with regard, what happened? What, what is the attitude of Aaron and Hur uh, and Joshua? The first thing you see here is Joshua's obedience. Joshua did as Moses had said. Got some guys, went down there. But then you see this. Aaron and Hur's ascendance. Notice what Aaron and Hur did not say to Moses. Come down. No, no. They said this. We're going up where he is. And we're going to help him. And I want you to note, while, while they were doing this, even at the, uh, the point of Moses' greatest weakness in verse 12, they chose ministry over mutiny. 
That's right. Moses couldn't stand. His arms were heavy. And they didn't say this. Now it's time to throw this guy off. He's done. Hello. Notice what they did. They put a seat under him. They held his hands before God. They chose ministry over mutiny. And as for Timothy, Paul said, I have confidence to, to send Timothy unto you. And so you see obedience, you see ascendance, and you see confidence in those that surround uh, the preacher, the man of God. And the problem is that anymore, because of, the, the, because of the seeds we've sown in our society, because of our lack of appreciation and respect for spiritual things in the first place, because of a desire in the hearts of many young people in the ministry, which is a problem in the ministry, folks, not just on your job. You have, we have too many people that instead of trying to help the pastor, they want to be the pastor. Right. Man, I prayed about this. And so, no man in genuine, with genuine power on his life has put himself in the position of choosing the ministry for himself. Moses didn't want it, and it angered the Lord. Paul recognized he didn't deserve it. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Putting me in the ministry. But nonetheless, God has ordered it. In Acts 20 and 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the, flock, uh, feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. This is why we said we left this part out last week. This is why we said, based on all these truths, not because we're anything, but because of what God says, that a church that will not choose to be accountable to godly spiritual leadership is out of its lane. And it's veering toward destruction, maybe even the judgment of God. Remember our text? Fire came down from heaven. Not from the man, from heaven. And same thing with Elijah, with the prophets of Baal. By the way, no servant with a right attitude is looking for that kind of thing anyway. You remember when the, the disciples uh, came to Jesus and there was somebody that, uh, that wasn't receiving them and the disciples said, hey, can we call down fire on their heads? And Jesus said, you know not what spirit you're of. Hmm? I didn't come to destroy life. I came to save it. That's God's desire. But the Bible says that Jesus did depart and he went to another village. By the way, do you not see this same parallel through the, book, uh, through the churches in Revelation? Hmm. Correct your course. Get yourself back where you should be, else I'll come and remove your candlestick. These things are tremendous responsibilities. And if I were to say anything less than what I've said, I'd feel like I've been unfaithful to God and his word. But then if I were not to also close by saying as Paul did, brethren, please pray for me that I might be what you need in the Lord. And what God requires before we all go answer to him. Let's stand and bow our heads for prayer. Thank you for your patience this morning. I hope I've been able to clarify my heart because there are so many in this day that have a wrong attitude and approach to pastoral ministry. 
And I do not want to be in that number. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help us now. We're grateful for, you, for your design of the church. We're grateful for how you've ordered it. We're grateful, Lord, for the instruction that you've given uh, both the pastor and the people. And so our prayer is by understanding, Lord, the role of both, as we've discussed, staying in our lane and, and fulfilling our role. Understanding the role of both, we know how to pray for and help one another. May you be glorified in, the, in that choice, in that direction, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed.